In February 1832, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon were working on the prophet's translation of the Bible. This wasn't a translation in a linguistic sense, where someone takes a text from one language and presents it in another. No, this was a project about seeking out meanings and insights that had been lost over hundreds of years of Christian thought and practice. Smith sought to expand upon what he had learned as an American Christian by increasing his spiritual knowledge through a concentrated reading of the King James Bible, clarifying and expanding the text of the Old and New Testaments between 1830 and 1833. Part of the prophet's translation process included asking questions. What does this verse mean? What else did the Lord have to tell him about figures like Melchizedek and Abraham? On February 16, 1832, Smith and Rigdon sought clarification on the text of John 5, verse 29, where Jesus Christ speaks on the resurrection, saying that those who have done good would receive the resurrection of life, and those who had done evil would reap the resurrection of damnation. As the prophet and his scribe, Sidney Rigdon, pondered what the two resurrections might mean, they beheld a vision of what awaited humankind after death, what has been canonized by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as Doctrine and Covenant Section 76, or what saints living in Joseph Smith's time called the vision. This vision presented new doctrines and understandings and introduced new vocabulary terms into the Latter-day Saint lexicon, words like celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdoms, and sons of perdition. Even familiar words like hell came to take on new meaning for Joseph Smith and members of what was then known as the Church of Christ. Neither Smith or Rigdon ever described in detail how the vision occurred, only that they both saw it at the same time. This shared nature is somewhat unusual in the field of receiving revelation. Philo Dibble, a Latter-day Saint, later remembered that Smith and Rigdon received the vision in the upstairs room of the John and Ann Johnson home. The Joseph Smith Papers Companion to the Doctrine and Covenants says that by turns, either Joseph Smith or Sidney Rigdon would ask, what do I see? And then relate the scene. After which the other would reply, I see the same. There is no indication in Dibble's account that anyone was recording the vision as it occurred. Instead, Dibble said that there was not a sound nor motion made by anyone in the room. One can only imagine the sacred moment in which there were a dozen men observing Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon receive section 76. Dibble recalled that Smith nor Rigdon did not move a joint or a limb during the time I was there. The Joseph Smith Papers Project found the first copy of section 76 was written down in July 1832, some four months after Smith and Rigdon's original experience, though it circulated quickly after that. Matthew McBride, in his essay on the vision in the Church's Revelations and Context series, available in the Gospel Library app, found that some saints found difficulty in understanding the new doctrines because it was so different from what they had been taught growing up as Christians in North America and Europe. Brigham Young, for instance, recalled that it was a great trial to many. Young himself had difficulty accepting the idea. He said, my traditions were such that when the vision came first to me, it was directly contrary and opposed to my former education. I said, wait a little. I did not reject it, but I could not understand it. He had to, quote, think and pray, to read and think, until he knew and fully understood it for himself. Others embraced it right away. For instance, Wilford Woodruff recalled, when I read the vision, it enlightened my mind and gave me great joy. It appeared to me that the God who revealed that principle unto man was wise, just, and true, possessed both the best of attributes and good sense and knowledge. I felt he was more consistent with love, mercy, justice, and judgment, and I felt to love the Lord more than ever before in my life. Joseph Smith's 1838 history proudly spoke of section 76. Nothing could be more pleasing to the saint than the light which burst upon the world through the foregoing vision, the sublimity of the ideas the purity of the language, the scope for action, the continued duration for completion, in order that the heirs of salvation may confess the Lord and bow the knee. The rewards for faithfulness and the punishments for sins are so much beyond the narrow-mindedness of men that every honest man, and I would add, or woman, is constrained to exclaim, it came from God. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm the public communications specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Janice Johnson is a Willis Center research associate at the Institute. And today we will be discussing 
the block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints' Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block that we believe will help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Now, Janice, something that caught your eye was the idea of revelation as process. Could you tell us more about that? I, I love looking at the beginning of section 76. We start off with this kind of beautiful flowery preamble. And then in verse five, the Lord starts speaking. And in verse seven, the Lord says, I will reveal all mysteries, yea, all the mysteries of my kingdom. And a mystery is really anything that is, is only known by revelation. And we get to see some of their process in verse 10. For by my spirit, I will enlighten them. And by my power, I will make known unto them the secrets of my will. And so in verse 11, we get this description. Joseph and Sidney being in the spirit on the 16th day of February. We get specifics. By the power of the spirit, our eyes were opened and our understandings were enlightened. As so as to see and to understand the seas, things of God. So they were discussing the 29th verse of the 5th chapter of John, which was given unto us as follows. And they were marveled, what we have in verse 18, that an understanding of what the verse meant was given to them by the Spirit. But they didn't just stop there. And I think that that's a critical point. While we meditated upon these things, Latter-day Saints aren't necessarily prone to meditation as a practice. And I think that it, it's something that could be a very rich practice for us as, as Latter-day Saints. While we meditated upon these things, the Lord touched the eyes of our understandings. I love that imagery. And they were opened and the glory of the Lord shone round about. They got the answer to their question initially, but only when they meditated upon that answer were they enabled to see. And I think that's a beautiful example to all of us. Absolutely. I also love that they were talking to each other about things. This is something in my life that often uh, what I would describe as a prompting or revelation has come to me through speaking to someone about the things that I am concerned with, whether it was a mission companion or a friend or a parent or just a trusted loved one. I find often that I find the answers to my prayers although not in such uh, an unusual or spectacular fashion as Section 76, in discussing things with others and hearing what they have to say. I also love in verses 16 through 24, Joseph Smith is very matter of fact in the Doctrine and Covenants where he describes what he sees. Uh, this is something that actually reminds me of in the gold plates. He does not say that they were golden plates. He said that they have the appearance of gold. He always wants to be as accurate as possible when describing things. And I love in verse 22, he says, he and Sidney Rigdon say, and now after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all, which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him, the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. And that's the whole ball game to me. There are so many marvelous things in this revelation. And yet the entire point in my mind is that we have heavenly parents. We have a savior. They created the world for us and they desperately want us to return to live with them. As it says in verse 40, it says, this is the gospel, the glad tidings, which the voice out of the heavens bore record unto us that he came into the world, even Jesus, to be crucified for the world and to bear the sins of the world and to sanctify the world and to cleanse it from all unrighteousness, that through him all might be saved. Not through him some might be saved or most might be saved, but all might be saved, whom the Father had put into his power and made by him. Now, this is something that I find really interesting is because there are so many interesting details in the first vision. There are many characteristics of those who inherit each kingdom, the terrestrial, the celestial, and the telestial, as well as those in outer darkness. But I think sometimes we focus on, oh no, am I going to the telestial kingdom, rather than does the atonement of Jesus Christ give me the opportunity to get where I want to go? 
And likewise, I think that sometimes we even use, we read through these sections and the, the descriptions of those who belong in each kingdom, and we kind of automatically start classifying people we know and implicitly judging them. And I don't believe that that was the point of this revelation, that, that for us to weaponize it against other people. I think we need to consider our relationship with Christ, where we are and where we need to go, what we can do to improve that. Um, if we are drawn to judging other people in the immortal words of Elder Uchtdorf, stop it. Um, and I think he very um, is very attuned to perhaps sometimes when we are in the mode of judging other people, it's really more about what we're feeling ourselves. He says, when we feel hurt, angry, or envious, it's quite easy to judge people. This topic could actually be taught in a two-word sermon. When it comes to hating, gossiping, ignoring, ridiculing, holding judges, or wanting to cause harm, please apply the following. Stop it. We have to stop judging others and replace judgmental thoughts and feelings with a heart full of love for God and his children. God is our Father. We are his children. We are all brothers and sisters. Amen to that. I would only add that this is essential that we extend that same charity that we extend to others to ourselves. Something that I find difficult, and often when I find myself judging myself, it will be, am I doing enough? Am I measuring up? When we are charitable with ourselves, that is when we have the opportunity to see ourselves as our heavenly parents see us. When we are willing to give the opportunity to neighbors or to our family members or those in our ward, uh, the benefit of the doubt, I fear that we often don't do it ourselves. I think about the worth of souls being great in the sight of God and how sometimes we say, well, their soul is great in the sight of God, but not mine. I think, uh, not to put words in President Ugdorf's mouth, but it's essential that we also think about offering ourselves the same grace and the same patience that we extend to others, recognizing not who we are now, but who, as our Heavenly Parents' children, we can become through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's beautiful, Joey. I love that. Um, and I think that as we look at these characteristics of those who receive celestial glory, grace is woven through the characteristics. This is not something that we're just left alone to figure out how to, to do this on our own. Um, it is the grace of Christ that enables us to receive it. Um, and one of the things I think is critical as we're looking at this text, but really all throughout scripture, and as we think about covenants that we've made, the word receive comes in really critical places. Just because a gift is offered doesn't mean we actually take it. And we always get the choice to take it, to receive it. Christ has performed this miraculous atonement and offered all of us the possibility, but we have to choose to take it. And those who receive celestial glory are those who receive the testimony of Jesus, who believed that he would and he could save us, that he offered us that grace, that free gift. We have to just choose to receive it. I think that that is something that can be difficult though and not to harp on the idea that we need to be kind to ourselves, but for instance, I am about to move and I'll think, oh, I don't want to bother anyone. I don't want to ask anyone to help me to move, regardless of the fact that I have helped other move, others move and will continue to help others move until I can't do so any longer. Okay. It's important not only to give to others, but to receive what others have given to us. Let's go back to 51, because I think that's, that's a perfect connection here. They are they who received the testimony of Jesus, believed on his name, and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in the water in his name, and thus according to the commandment which was given, that by keeping the commandments they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins. Now, what commandment principally enables us to be washed and cleansed from our sins. Baptism initially, but then repentance keeps us in the covenant. I think sometimes we think about 
the celestial kingdom and we think of this long laundry list of all the things that we have to do to qualify. But primarily, we enter the covenant and we stay in the covenant by repentance. This is, this is the primary task that we have. And then receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power. Again, we receive that gift of the Holy Ghost and then we act on it. Absolutely. And I can't think of a more beautiful principle in thinking about what Latter-day Saints share with other Christians than the belief that we must accept Jesus Christ and his atonement into our lives to receive his grace and to become closer to him. Now, something that I find interesting about Section 76 is that there's a lot going on in American religion, uh, as well as world religion, about the place of heaven or the afterlife. Now, this is unsurprising. Most of us think about uh, where we would like to go after we die and the state of our relationships afterwards. But there was a Swedish mystic named Emanuel Swedenborg who also spoke about different degrees of glory uh, in his theological writings. And in an article that J.B. Hawes, a friend of the Institute and a professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University, found in an article that he entitled Joseph Smith, Emanuel Swedenborg, and Section 76, The Importance of the Bible in Latter-day Saint Revelation, why Latter-day Saints should embrace that others found truths as well. Now, Swedenborg doesn't speak to the specificity or the exact details that Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon share in Section 76, but nevertheless, there are certainly similarities. And Hawes asks his readers to think about the fact that the Lord has extended spiritual knowledge to others of all religious traditions or those of no religious tradition because he loves and cares about his children no matter where they are. It's also important to keep in mind that Joseph Smith was familiar with Emanuel Swedenborg and that at least one convert to early Mormonism spoke with Joseph Smith about Swedenborg's teachings. However, it's also important to remember that Joseph Smith and Emanuel Swedenborg were reading the same Bible. So some folks may say, oh no, how did they arrive at thinking about these things? The answer comes because ideas about bodies telestial, terrestrial, and celestial come in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When you're reading the same things, some folks will often be asking questions about the same things. And we receive light and knowledge based on what we have and where we are. All that is to say, Latter-day Saints do not have a monopoly on truth. It's important for us to realize that others have uh, received truths as well. And I think that Paul talking about being caught up to the third heaven is another example here. This, this provokes the mind of believing people all over the world to, to seek out God and to seek out more truth. And that is a glorious thing. Yeah, I think about President Hinckley's uh, injunction to us, right? That when we are extending the gospel to others, we're asking them to add to what they already have rather than take away from the goodness they have already received. I also want to speak to uh, an idea in American religious history, but also global Christian history, about what is called universalism. Now, universalism is the idea that God will save each and every person on the earth, regardless of what they have done, or who they are, or where they have lived, things of that nature. And it's important to remember that Joseph Smith Sr., the prophet's father, and his grandfather, Aziel Smith, were universalists. They believed that God would save everyone regardless of what had happened uh, to them in life or what they had performed. But there was also a strain of Calvinism based on the teachings of John Calvin that God would save whom he would save, and it is not up to humans to determine who would receive salvation. Sorry, the, dude. You can't choose. Yeah. And this is part of what's interesting in thinking about this is you have Joseph Smith's father and grandfather saying everyone is saved. You don't have a choice whether you are saved or not. And you have Calvinists, on the other hand, saying you have no choice whether you are saved. You can only do your best to have confirmation for yourself that you are saved. And so Joseph Smith comes down the middle and says, no, choice is essential to this sort of thing. And this is 
distinctive to Latter-day Saint teachings, but also reflects Joseph Smith's interest in Methodism, the idea that choice and choosing to come to Jesus Christ to continue to build faith and repent and in a Latter-day Saint context, enter into covenants and continue to keep them, to stay on the covenant path, is essential to the gospel plan. Now, there are some folks, including early Latter-day Saints, who thought, why on earth should everybody be saved if everyone behaves differently or does not believe? In fact, Joseph Young, Brigham's brother, said, I could not believe the vision at first. Why was the Lord going to save everybody? And I actually think about the parable of the talents here, which is that uh, it doesn't matter when you come in, what matters is entering into the covenant and receiving the grace that Christ has offered to each of us. And I think that perfectly is perfectly encapsulated in verse 69. These are they who are just women and men made perfect through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, who wrought out the per this perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood. President Eyring said, these are they that choose to be lifted by him. We choose. And that, that absolute reliance on Christ is essential. Um, there's one other thing that, I, that I've been thinking about, um, the idea of overcoming. Because in this list of characteristics of celestial glory, we have in verse 53, those who overcame by faith. And I think this goes along with the prophet Alma teaching us about that Christ has felt all of our pains, afflictions, and temptations. And that's how we overcome in mortality. Some of those pains, afflictions, and temptations will ultimately kill us. In mortality, we can't overcome all things. But later in verse 60, it says, they shall overcome all things. At this later point, we will be able to ultimately overcome all. In mortality, we overcome through faith in Christ. And some of those things will end our mortal life. But ultimately, we will be able to overcome all things through Christ. And that is the fate of those just men and women who choose Christ. Something that I've been thinking about is that there is no limit to grace that Christ offers to us. Like, grace is not a business model that the Lord uses. It's a model that every single person always has access to. And something for Latter-day Saints to think about is that with work for the dead, we believe that the power of grace extends beyond mortality, that we will always have the ability to come closer to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, to, to quote uh, Elder Uchtdorf again, he says, salvation cannot be bought with the currency of obedience. It is purchased by the blood of the Son of God. If we want to return to the presence of the Lord, we need Christ. And choosing Christ will lead us there.